Why do you guys do what you do? I mean, you spend so much time, so much of your life running ATS, creating an ATS. What's the problem you guys are trying to solve for? Start with you, Kat. Hello. Um, look, the problem is how do you bring a security to the marketplace? Um, there are incredible number of ideas out there in terms of how to create a representation of fractional ownership of something. Um, the securities law is wrapped completely around that. And you have a lot of founders who don't know that law. So a lot of times what we spend um, doing with our customers is to act an education process around what you need to do to have a proper offering. What is the right uh, investor type based on the asset that you have, the performance, how it's going to be paying out, the amount of money you're going to be raising. So it is, we're, we are almost more educators than sales um, in terms of what we do and giving them the pros and cons around, you know, if you're going to tokenize and go digital, what does that give you? What is the benefit? How do you go about that? Um, does it make sense? Doesn't it make sense? Um, and you have clients who sit and process this information. We, we had one customer recently. We started the conversations with them. They had zero clue about securities law. Like, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. By the time we signed them up, um, it took us about a month and a half. They knew all the jargon, all the terminology, and it was great to see because we really walk away as partners. Um, because an ATS really only succeeds if our partners succeed, our customers succeed, um, we end up forming really strong bonds with our clients. So just like here we're hearing about that this is an ecosystem, our customers are the reason why the ecosystem needs to exist. Any other thoughts? No, yeah, look, I think, that. you know, you have, um, you know, you have several layers of kind of obligations here, right? You have obligations to your Assure clients, and that's critical, and I think there's a significant amount of education, consulting, advocacy that goes into that role, because folks will usually come to the question of, do I need secondary liquidity fairly cold, and what it takes for them to um, achieve that objective, although, you know, nine out of ten people will think it's a good idea. Uh, is uh, will require a lot of education. But you have obligations to the investors that are going to be getting access to those securities once they, once they start to be quoted on your ATS, uh, including obligations as a broker-dealer operator of an ATS, uh, as well as, um, uh, as an introducing broker-dealer, potentially, depending on your setup. You have obligations to your SRO and to the, uh, and to the SEC. Um, and I think you also have an obligation to the industry and to the community that we're all trying to develop to uh, create an environment that provides frictionless, continuous, automated liquidity for assets that haven't had that before uh, and in a way that uh, connects good issuers and willing investors uh, for uh, attractive investment opportunities that are compliant and uh, well thought through. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's, there are these multiple layers and at the end of the day, um, you, you know, the job is exciting, but it's an important one because even before you get to the digital blockchain piece of it, these layers apply even in traditional secondary liquidity on the ATS. And once you kind of connect the digital piece of it, I think the complexity and the responsibility, because then we are truly building for 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, becomes doubly so. So, um, you know, we all have to be really good, really focused, and really responsible. So, Sean, perhaps I can ask you this, right? So, just hearing this, like, when would you say and issuers should start thinking about secondary liquidity. Like, what, what like, does it matter? Like, can you issue and then think about secondary liquidity, or would you suggest like thinking about it 
at a different uh, time period. Yeah, I think that would determine the strategy of what type of offering they're going to put out there. Um, and to Alan's point, we think ATS is solved for the problem of liquidity and private securities. Um, you know, <clears throat> issuers have op different opportunities, uh, different choices. Um, an IPO is not the right choice for every issuer. Uh, they might not be at the right stage of development. Uh, they might, want, might, might not want to take on the cost or compliance burdens of, an, of a public issuance. Uh, and we think that the private securities markets offer enough flexibility where they can choose the right option for themselves. Um, you know, once again, as we feel as IPOs and SPACs uh, issuance this year are slowing up, we think there's a lot of opportunities for issuers to take advantage of the exemptions out there get into this market. So w w when should an issuer start thinking about liquidity? I think very early on in their life cycle. Um, you know, when they start getting investors in is when they need to start thinking about the liquidity because that's what investors are thinking about. They're thinking about what's my exit going to be here? Is it, you know, obviously they want to you know, believe that the company's going to make it, but even if it's a very successful company, the investor could be waiting around 10, 15 years until they get a liquidity event. Um, think about, you know, think about their employees as well. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, especially if you're a tech company and you're in the market, you're competing for talent, and, and who are you competing against? You're competing against Google and Amazon and people like that who have very good stock packages and very liquid, and very liquid stock. And um, if you're a private company with, and you're not offering this to, to your employees or you're offering them you know, s stock that is not liquid, then you can't compete. I mean, Airbnb, um, before they went public, I, th I think the number is employees left $4 billion of unexecuted options on the table because there was no secondary liquidity market. They couldn't afford to, execute, to, to exercise them. Um, so yeah, the question, I, th I think companies should be thinking about this very early on and you know, all, all of us here are trying to solve these problems for them. But, but if I think about a regular offering document for a Reg D placement, for example, right? In it, like, I've been doing this for like 25 years, right? Each one of them says, hey man, you can't sell this. If you ever think about selling it, you got to give me an opinion of counsel that costs at least $5,000, right? Telling me that this, um, this transfer doesn't violate securities law. So how do you guys plan on like overcoming that normalcy in the, in the documentation? Well, you can blame the lawyers for that, Gautam. <laughs> well, yes, I do, but you, know, but you guys have to overcome it. How do you do that? Um, you have to put disclosures into these documents, and disclosures always say the worst thing in the world could happen, basically, like we found out with Coinbase last week. You know? So um, are you talking about the legal opinion, though? They don't, you don't often see that in the document, that you need to get a legal opinion. Oh, I do, in Reg D documentation? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, this is like, we're, we're solving for it right now, is to like how to overcome that. So, so I, would argue, I would argue on that one, that what, you know, lawyers telling you you need a legal opinion, that's what that is, <laughs> really, right? Of course they're going to say that. Um, but w what is the legal opinion for? Well, they want to make sure that you're compliant with Rule 144. What are, the, or, you know, what are the rules around Rule 144? Have you held it for a year? So in a paper world, You'd be, you know, you'd, the lawyer would be getting the original subscription documents, looking at these types of things and figuring out if the uh, investor had held it, in it for a year and was able to sell it. When you have a blockchain ledger, which is recording this type of information, you've got it right there. Um, there's other parts of Rule 144, if it's a qualified institutional buyer and so forth. A lot of that, you know, so that can be associated with the wallet, the, the identity of the, of, the, uh, of the purchaser of these things. So that's exactly what we're trying to do, solve these problems using technology. And I think it can very, very well be done. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point, but I, and, and, you know, some of it still is probably kind of in Blade Runner territory because, you know, until, until the self-regulating nature of smart contracts is permitted, or at a minimum accepted uh, uh, to have a greater role in the compliance process like the one that you described, Rich. But I think, you know, for the time being, however, you know, what we're trying to do, and it goes to your point nicely that when do you start thinking about liquidity before you actually do the primary capital raise, the issuer has to be in the frame and frame of mind that a year from now, your counsel is going to go and will give a blanket 144 opinion that will unlock the entire class of shares for non-affiliates so that it can get uploaded to an ATS and trade. And structuring the primary with that in mind and, 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 be, and, and, and being, in that, uh, being in that zone is really important. 
Um, again, look, you know, at some point technology, and, and really, look, you don't talk much about it, but the really exciting thing about blockchain is the self-regulating nature of smart contracts, as well as other programmable features. Uh, that'll come. Um, but until then, you know, there's old school ways to unlock the entire class of assets, uh, whether under Rule 144, potential under Section 4A7, uh, among accredited investors sooner, uh, or whether the distribution compliance is over for your regular securities, and they're ready to come back on shore and trade under 144. So it's, uh, you know, for now it's old school paper planning, even though your PPM will say all sorts of CYA stuff. The, uh what we are forgetting, right, we're thinking about the ATS and the continuous trading or it's a peer-to-peer -peer negotiation. Um, but the key value that I think a lot of us bring to our customers is really just how we're capturing the information when we're onboarding the investor and when we're going through that primary issuance. Um, without it being fully digital in a token type of way, a lot of the information and the data that we're capturing today is very different in terms of how we store it and how everything is tagged on the back end. So APIs still work, right? So we are migrating these clients and these offerings to a more digital way of interacting and being able to action uh, components of the issuer and the um, investor identity and match them up. So. Uh, Previously, my husband and I, we got into alternative investments, let's say about seven years ago, and I just remember the stack of documents he had to sign, right? And when we do a demo to our uh, clients right now, it's just clicks. So it's, it's not fully tokenized, but the way we collect the information and store all of it allows for an easier process, as Dave keeps saying, you know, for the normal folks to be able to click around and do this. And look, that's a story, right, to your, you know, yeah, there will be an opinion, but it's going to be one opinion once, and then your shares are freely transferable under federal securities laws. Go open up a brokerage account, transfer them in there, uh, go through the process with a wonderful transfer agent, put you know, deposit it with a broker dealer, and start trading, as opposed to each time you get a stack of paper. So. We still have yeah, it to. It doesn't work. It yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, we still. Right. I mean, you know, what's you know, what's the time and cost for executing a kind of completely bilateral private resale? It's huge, and uh, both in terms of cost frictions, time frictions, uncertainty, etc., and, so, and and all the stuff that comes with it, including barriers to inclusion, right. which are really for small employees. You know, it's important in up markets. It's important in down markets. Tech employees get paid a lot in stock. If you're in a down market, you just got let go and your only source of savings is your vested stock and you can't do anything with it, you're not in a good position. So down markets present different kinds of uh, uh, use cases for secondary liquidity as well. Any, any other thoughts about like, you know, the issuers in the room and friends of issuers in the room, like about things that they should think about before issuance of a security, right? So but with, with a view towards secondary market liquidity, I mean, does it, what? I think it's um, uh, somebody today said, you know, without a customer, you don't really have a product, right? Yeah. Um, so as an issuer, you got to think about who is going to be your target audience, who is going to be buying, what is the size um, of the offering that you're going to raise? Are you going to become a serial uh, issuer, or this is just a one-off? So you really need to think about who is going to buy my product. And that is going to start to help you define what um, exemption you can classify under. And you know, do you guys, on your ATSs, right, uh, is tokenization a requirement? I'm, I'm going to say no. Um, and they, and the, the reason why is um, because we want to give our clients options, right? Um, we have some clients who start with tokenization in mind, don't go there. We have some clients who start with tokenization in mind and stay there. And we have some clients who don't start with tokenization. And then as we're going through the process, they kind of say, we want to be forward thinking and do this. So there is pros and cons, right? We, we've talked about how we are trying to smooth out the whole process, integrate all the systems. So tokenization today is not easy. So there is a higher cost to actually go in there. Um, so 
but there are customers for whom it makes absolute sense. And that's why, again, we are all here and that's why we are all working together because we ourselves are not going to solve it. Tokenization is a requirement on our ATS. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, yeah, we see the tremendous benefits of the technology and to us it just doesn't make sense to use different technology or you know, legacy technology to, 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 to facilitate the trading on our ATS. However, on primary markets, we don't require tokenization. But if somebody wants to raise capital, it's not tokenized, fine, we can do that for them. But when you want to have liquidity, then we tokenize it, and then that, everything kind of falls into place at that point, and, uh, and, and we can enable the liquidity in the ATS. It's uh, not a requirement on our ATS as well. Uh, we're taking the hybrid approach. We think there's a number of issuers out there that aren't ready for tokenization, to Cat's point, um, various other reasons. But we think once we have them on our platform, it gives us an opportunity to educate them on the benefits of tokenization, better cap table management, lower trading fees, um, you know, safe counterparty execution on our platform. Uh, so we think maybe their next raise or our next issuance, we can you know, give them that opportunity to uh, tokenize as well. Yeah, look, I think we have a view that Tokenization is a spectrum. It's not a binary situation. Either you're tokenized or you're not. And that some level of digital enhancement to a security is valuable. Uh, whether that digital enhancement means that there is a courtesy carbon copy of the record uh, of uh, holders of record and beneficial owners in pseudonymized form on chain uh, that provides transparency provides potential granular connectivity with the investors uh, uh, and the issuer while allowing traditional conventional books and records of market participants, including a TA and a broker dealer to control from a regulatory perspective, which delivers one kind of an ecosystem. So it's a, you know, it's a hybrid between old and new, or whether you go you know, to, the, to the end of the spectrum and have a digital asset security that's issued, custodied, and settled on chain. Um, you know, trading on chain is still sort of a work in progress, at least at scale, given technology and, and, uh, and regulatory topics. But, uh, you know, for us, you know, we find that some level of digital enhancement uh, is really important, really valuable, and to the point that was made, uh, is a good investment in the future because it allows you to uplift uh, to um, a digital asset security or uh, to add features that are connected uh, to the smart contract that sits with that security, even if it is, for now, from a regulatory perspective, um, uh, redundant. So, okay, that, those are all excellent points. So, so you guys have differing, differing views as to whether tokenization is required or not. You know, but if somebody does tokenize, like, like what happens, like, does it matter to you guys which chain they're on? And you know, what would you advise an issuer with regards to a chain choice? I can say it doesn't really matter to us. No, we're chain agnostic. Um, obviously, we work with you guys, and I know you're supporting Ethereum, Mainnet, and Tezos. Tezos is proof of stake, so it's much better transaction fees. You know, Ethereum was the, was the original uh, smart contract blockchain. I think you know, so people are doing looking at Tezos, uh, Polygon. Um, other proof of stake change would totally make sense, um, especially if you're thinking like in a Reg D, you've got two, maybe you've got 2,000 investors and you've got gas fees of you know 200 to 500 or whatever it is. It really adds up, you know. Um, when the merge comes on on and ETH goes to uh, proof of stake, I think you'll see a lot of stuff flowing back onto that chain for, uh, in the security token space. But for now, like a lot of us are looking at these other proof of stake chains. But it, does, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Yeah, I think to Richard's point, um, RETS is uh, blockchain agnostic as well. Um, you know, our only limiting principle is who our custodian can connect to. Um, there's a lot of blockchain options out there, so not every custodian can connect to everyone. Um, also, I, you know, I, I think uh, in terms of which blockchain, to some of Richard's point, um, you have to talk to your issuers about how what the costs would be, uh, and even the energy used on the blockchain. I mean, a lot of a lot of issuers are very uh, conscious now. Um, um, and also, you know, in terms of the proof of stake, you know, when you have the validators putting their own funds at risk, it leads to better speed and quality of uh, validations on the blockchain as well. So there's some of the considerations we talk to issuers about. 
Yeah, look, you know, we're not here to pick winners and losers. I think, you know, that battle is going to get, you know, fought out for a while. And I think the the move of, the, of Ethereum to proof of stake in view of uh, ESG and other concerns in the market um, uh, is an important one. That'll that'll change things. But and obviously on the technology side of the house, T0 has its own tokenization business. That's an Ethereum-based environment. But issuers come to us from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of them may be tokenized already with XYZ or ABC. And I think our goal is is to is to be interoperable with that uh, uh, with that background. Folks who are not tokenized already, you know, could decide to tokenize with us or with somebody else. And uh, our goal is to uh, to support that. And I will echo the sentiment that we have to be agnostic. Um, the big headache is for the guys like you, uh, Medium Veritalo, um, and the custodian for us, the ATS is really what we do. We are not claiming to say, we're gonna advise you on exactly what to do. This is why I think these partnerships are important. We, we took, I think Dave started out with, this is an ecosystem, we are good at certain things, and there are people that are good at others. So we do look to partners like you to um, help our clients guide. Okay, well, thanks for that. So I want to address, we're going to run out of time shortly, but so I want to just ask you guys, okay, so this is a forum for, for us to talk about everything about the future and, um, and, the, and to, to an extent the current stage. So if you are thinking about going to a meeting at your favorite regulator, what would you ask them to change about the way you guys are currently uh, forced into doing business? Let's start with you, Alan. Yeah, look, you know, people have been saying for a while, we want clarity, we want rules, we want regulation, right? Kind of make rules, not war type stuff. And you've seen that echoed recently over the last couple of weeks as a conversation about enhancements to SEC's division of enforcement staff. and, and and Chairman Gensler was in the Hill a day or two ago, talking, you know, asking for more funding again uh, around the enforcement uh, enforcement environment at the SEC. Um, and Commissioner Peirce, you know, uh, echoed the point that you know you are not a police agency with a rulemaking side; you are a rulemaking organization with an enforcement division uh, as as part of it. So you know, the 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 kind of the the desire was always work with us as an industry to come up with enhancements, clarifications, new rule proposals that will allow us to unfold the vision of digitally native, self-regulating value ecosystem that sits on the single technology layer and thus to value whether it's securities or other assets uh, as what internet did to data and voice. Um, and we recognize it's a journey, and it's a journey, yes, of intermediation, disintermediation, uh, but uh, it's one that we will, you know, we'll travel together in steps, and that's been a conversation. You know, the downside is that without the right education and, and policy and advocacy efforts in Washington and at the state level, um, you know, be careful what you wish for in terms of rulemaking. And so I think as an industry, um, and you see some of this happening. I think FTX has been really good in, in, uh, in DC recently. Um, and you know, this, this intermediation part of the overall thesis here, you know, they're playing out in the commodity space now. Uh, but I think ed you know, closer connectivity, education uh, with uh, policymakers, whether in Congress, whether at the SEC, CFTC, or other federal or state agencies is critical. And I think, you know, as opposed to just defaulting to uh, well, you know, there's a Supreme Court court case out there from 1946, and you know, we have a police force, and that's the end of that. So. Thank you. Yeah. What I would say is, you know, obviously, um, you know, Jay Clayton and, and, and Gary Gensler, you know, following him, have been uh, you know, fa fairly harsh on the crypto space. I think, uh, if anything, you know, Gary Gensler seems to be taking a harsher line. And he's got, you know, I understand where he's coming from to a certain extent. He you know, wants to make sure that, especially with you know, Luna happening, I think that's kind of vindicated a lot of his positions. I think, if, you know, my, my message would be, okay, fine, I understand it, but here, you know, here, we're the good guys here. We're trying to do everything. We're going to you. We are coming in and telling you about what we're doing. Maybe we should have a little bit, you know, give us a little bit of slack while you go after these guys. Help us out. We want to help you. We want to bring this space forward. But we seem to get thrown a lot of the same, thrown into the same bucket, which is frustrating. Uh, um, 
my ask would be more of have an open mind. Um, I think a lot of the rules were created because um, the securities market needed to be defined. The technology that um, blockchain is bringing fo forward is fundamentally changing the risk factors, right? And so the old rules and laws that govern the securities market today don't apply to this new technology. So yes, for traditional security markets, keep those laws because there's reasons why that had to happen. Um, for this market, sit down, like I said, with the experts in the room, with people who are living and breathing this, and truly understand the paradigm shift of the risk profile and what, how you're trying to protect the investor. Yeah, and, and just to dovetail off of that, I think uh, loosening up some of the regulations, they put a lot of restrictions on the settlement and custody of digital securities. I think if you open it up to more of the traditional settlement process, processes and pipes, so to say, um, you'll have a lot more liquidity and, and um, you know, I, we met with DTCC here and they're trying to uh, kind of use <clears throat> the infrastructure that's in place now uh, to help with the settlement and custody of digital securities. And if you open it up to the private banks and what have you, I think you're going to find that the digital security issuances and liquidity is going to explode. You know, look, I think it's a great point. And, and you're right. You know, crypto has been a curse and a blessing. It elevated the dialogue around the role of blockchain in the asset ecosystem in terms of digitally native self-regulating instruments that are inclusive and frictionless. Uh, but uh, that's a blessing. The curse is that we all get lumped in with crypto, rightly or wrongly. And you know, the bulk of the conversations we've been having with re regulators, as so long as I've been doing this the last four years, is we are not crypto. And a lot of the concerns that you have, rightly or wrongly, in many cases rightly, including from an investor protection, goes back to the earlier point that we're all a community and we kind of all owe a responsibility to ourselves to do the right thing because you know, somebody sneezes, we all get a cold. Uh, but we are, you know. We are the solution to the problem that you have, um, and you know that's that's an important message. And the other point is, you're absolutely right. You know, the World Economic Forum had a sit down with a bunch of banks and regulators and kind of new companies like us. This, gosh, this was you know pre-COVID, two plus years ago. And the outcome of that was digital securities are great, but until you solve the cash leg of the settlement cycle, it kind of doesn't matter. And so, even if you look at the proposals like uh, special purpose broker dealers that can touch securities that are issued, custodied, and settled on chain without clearing firms or um, or custodians, unless you have people keeping your you know keeping your keys in some fashion. That's all wonderful, but they're not allowed to touch crypto, you know, directly. Maybe, you know, there's some guidance from the SEC. Well, maybe if you staple a custodian to them, like the three-party model, no action letter, maybe, you know, crypto can be part of the cycle. But until you solve the cash leg, and, you know, it, you know a lot of organizations, including DTCC, are working on that, um, the, you know, the environment is, is hobbled. Well, um, great. Great to hear from everybody what you guys are doing. You've explained why you guys spend so much of your life working on ATSs, so I really appreciate that. And um, I think we're out of time, so um, thanks again, and um, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.